So the broad questions that I'm interested in have to do with just the nature and purpose of interpretations of physical theories and what this has to do with relations between theories. And I've uh, been interested for a long time uh, since I wrote that book really uh, in what the question of interpretation is really about and what influenced the logical positivists had, especially Carnap, on our understanding of what a physical theory is and how it's interpreted, and the influence of Einstein on them. And I've always been, been struck by something I've heard since I was a child in philosophy, <laughs> namely that the, the logical empiricists uh, generally didn't have that sense of scientific practice or that interest in scientific practice that people claimed to be developing uh, after Kuhn, uh, when it, it just seemed to me that in many cases, they were too close to scientific practice and, and not taking a critical distance from remarks on practice made by scientists. And of course, some of them like uh, Carnap and Reichenbach in particular were really deeply involved in working out, especially Reichenbach in working out uh, implications of the general theory of relativity. Uh, I don't know anyone who doesn't have some questions or problems with Reichenbach's interpretation of general relativity, but no one can say that he wasn't close enough to the work of working physicists on it, I think. Um, but I'm interested in the, the notion of a physical theory that they developed and the notion of what it means to interpret a physical theory and how that relates to contemporary problems in philosophy of science. So in particular, uh, to distinguish questions about physical theory, like the one we all, about interpretation rather, that we have a, about quantum mechanics, like what sort of ontology perhaps should we think of quantum mechanics as revealing versus questions of just empirical interpretation. What is the empirical content of a theory? And Einstein came out of a philosophical tradition that uh, placed a heavy emphasis on this question and on a kind of answer to it that they took to have been developed by modern mathematics in the late 19th and early 20th centuries through the work of people, especially like Poincaré and Hilbert and how this influenced the development of general relativity and then the development of the kind of philosophy of science that was influenced by general relativity. And so I'd, li I'd like to focus in particular on the special case of the relation between Einstein's use of the epistemology of theories and Carnap's conception of theoretical frameworks, which I realize is somewhat uh, discredited since the work of Quine, but uh, I don't I don't quite accept that view of it. I think there's something more uh, useful in it uh, and something more useful than, than Quine and, and followers of Quine have generally acknowledged. And that I think in some ways, and I think I'm not the only person to point this out, aspects of theories that Quine himself accepted though he didn't accept the language in which Carnap expressed them. So this is what I think of as a sort of minimal Carnapianism, a Carnapian view of theories that uh, I think is sufficiently Carnapian, but also sufficiently sensitive to the way that theoretical physics has evolved in the past century, in the past, say, well, in a, in a way, in the past three centuries since Newton. And so the notion that a physical theory is a conceptual framework that defines a, a set of internal questions about the nature and existence of its objects, and along with empirical methods for answering those questions, I take to be a basic Carnapian commitment. I also think it's, it, it seems to me like something that not even uh, Quine really seriously disagreed with. And some of his famous remarks, some of his most famous remarks about the ontology of scientific theories are compatible with this view. Like what we should take to be real should be what our best theory quantifies over. Uh, a less 
Quinean friendly aspect of this minimal Carnapian view is the notion that a framework is characterized by rules that explicate its fundamental concepts. And this is something that I think Carnap thought of as a natural and, and self-evident uh, conclusion to draw from the history of axiomatics leading up to the general theory of relativity, right? that mathematical theories are not answerable to anything in intuition or necessarily anything in the physical world, but they're capable of explicating their fundamental concepts through their axioms, implicitly defining them. And as a theoretical framework in science, a mathematical framework uh, can, has to be characterized by some way of attaching it to observation and measurement. And finally, and this is of course, we could talk about the merits of this later if, if anyone would like to. This is a sort of definitely unquinian aspect of this minimally Carnapian view that there's an important difference between evaluating such a framework as a whole from an outside perspective and evaluating its internal theoretical and empirical claims. So for example, you know, asking a question within the context of Newtonian mechanics, right? why is the, the, the motion of Mercury's perihelion anomalous? Well, there, the framework specifies definite ways of answering such a question. There has to be another mass or there has to be some perturbing factor because that's how Newtonian physics had worked for 200 years at that time. The time Einstein was thinking about this problem anyway. Uh, that the framework has rules that require you to seek out the cause of every departure from a simple Keplerian motion, or even more broadly, every departure from uniform rectilinear motion. But in a simple model of a point particle moving in a gravitational field, Anything that's not a simple Keplerian motion requires an explanation. And it seems that that's, a, that's the kind of obvious case in which there's an internal question that has to be answered by the rules of Newtonian physics. And that Einstein also posed an external question. Uh, should we keep this framework or should we adopt a different one in which there's a natural solution to this problem? And this is not a new way of thinking about Einstein's theory that Einstein himself had, or about Newton's theory, excuse me. But if you look at the work of Ernst Mach, for example, there's a very clear distinction in Mach between his favorite uh, philosophical uh, problem with that theory, the problem of absolute rotation, and this uh, as an internal problem of Newtonian mechanics and as an external problem about the problem of the possibility of other theoretical frameworks. Uh, so it's, it's not very clear just because of the way Max uh, science of mechanics developed over time, but it's certainly clear, I think, enough that Mach thought that you could clearly distinguish whether there is such a thing as absolute rotation within Newtonian mechanics that is required by the theory, and whether we would prefer to have a theory that didn't mention absolute rotation. And that you could solve the problem of absolute rotation internally to Newtonian mechanics by getting rid of absolute space, but keeping inertial frames and, and absolute rotation and absolute acceleration. And the external question, whether we really should have a theory that's capable of making such distinctions. And so I think that these sort of these minimal Carnapian principles are principles that I think are not unrealistic depictions of how theories have worked since we've had what we can call theoretical physics, that is beginning with Newton's Principia. Uh, 
But the, the other sort of Carnapian program is how to explicate the empirical content of theoretical physics. And there are two ways of thinking about explication in Carnap, at least, or two uh, explication projects in Carnap. And one of them is the one that I think is most familiar that I, I briefly alluded to before, that in general, an, a philosophical explication is an attempt to give a conceptual analysis that's useful or that provides a basis for a useful framework. And that's not uh, a kind of Kantian type of analysis in the old fashioned sense in which you find out what the concept really contains, right? So you're not, it's an, it's an explication that's not answerable to your pre-theoretical understanding of a concept, but is only answer, answerable to the utility of the framework that's constructed around that concept. And of course, this is one of his arguments concerning analyticity, that you know, if, he doesn't, if he doesn't capture analyticity in a sense required by Quine, the, he doesn't care if he's captured, uh, if he's explicated analyticity in a way that's useful for understanding how scientific theories work. Not that that isn't still a matter of debate. But the other type of explication is explication of empirical content of a scientific framework. And Carnap, I think, even though he abandoned the kind of foundationalism of the Aufbau fairly quickly after writing it, uh, he never really abandoned the idea that ultimately an explication of the content of a physical theory has to do with reduction. He began with the notion it's that it's reduced to elementary subjective experiences of an observer, and then he moved to a more physicalistic understanding of that. But generally, the explication of empirical content was supposed to have something to do with arriving at a kind of reduction basis. In a kind of complete language, an ideal language of unified science, there would be a uh, kind of deductive relationship between the principles of theoretical physics and descriptions of the states of observers. And that of course is a distant ideal, but still something possible and something to be aimed at. Now, I, I'm not going to read all these quotes from Einstein because they're very famous. Uh, I'm just going to say a little bit about them, but uh, Einstein not only appealed to, and it's, this is, these are quotes from his famous paper called Geometry and Experience, as you probably know. He not only appealed to this notion from axiomatic, the history of axiomatic mathematics, but he also claimed that without this attitude toward mathematics, he could not have discovered the general theory of relativity. So this quote that as far as the propositions of mathematics refer to reality, they're not certain. As far as they are certain, they don't refer to reality. I mean, that's in a way a very old empiricist notion, but you could say there's a kind of ancestor of it in Hume. Uh, but the, the contemporary interest of it was that through the 19th century, at least toward the end of the 19th century, and by the time Einstein was working on physics, really, there had this understanding had emerged that mathematical theories can be thought of purely formally, that they've been separated from intuition, uh, that, what, that one can in, in general separate their structure from their content, and that this is the radical aspect of the philosophy of, math of mathematics after Kant. Kant had no notion of uninterpreted mathematics because he had notion, no notion of mathematics being understood independently of the intuitions that make its terms meaningful and its proofs possible. And so the achievements of 19th century logic and analysis in removing that element of appeal to intuition and achieve, achieving the task that Hilbert spoke of, of expressing the axioms of geometry, for example, in such a way that you can actually <clears throat> 
logically deduce the propositions from them without having to draw a diagram uh, was something that evidently Einstein made a great deal of. And what makes geometry into a physical science is following a notion that began with Helmholtz and Poincaré, some appeal to a principle of interpretation that coordinates real objects of experience with what are otherwise empty conceptual schemata. And this, this is really no different from the attitude expressed by Poincaré, I think, that there's simply no question of mathematical truth. There's also the attitude of Hilbert, I think, that there's there's a, a notion of consistency and not of truth. And that in, in many ways, this is part of the motivation for Carnap and others thinking there was still a, a role for analyticity, that it's simply a question about the structure of, of even of any mathematical theory, right? Uh, what is true with respect to that theory? And that an application to the world is a completely different kind of interpretation. Now, this brings me to the point of asking this general question of interpretation. What are we doing when we interpret a physical theory? I think one of the themes in the background of my thinking today is that there's, there, there's a sharp distinction in my mind, which I think, which I think was generally made blurry by uh, the logical empiricists, including Carnap, uh, influenced by Einstein, but I, I, I wouldn't accuse Einstein of having the same confusion or making the same, blurring the same distinction. And that is the distinction between thinking of mathematics as uninterpreted formalism and thinking of theories, physical theories, as uninterpreted calculi, that this fairly clear distinction that was made by the end of the 19th century between a purely formal mathematical structure and some use of it through interpretation as a way of describing the world. And on the other hand, a physical theory, as if it were too a pure formalism in need of an interpretation. And I think there's something wrong with that, but I'll come back to that question. And in one way that we ask the, the question of interpretation is, uh, this was a, a famous philosopher of our time said this, so to, uh, to interpret a theory like quantum mechanics is to ask the question something like, well, what would the world be like if the theory were true? Uh, a question which never really made sense to me because if quantum mechanics were true, what the world would be like is the way it is. We live in a world in which quantum mechanics is as true as a physical theory ever is, and this is what it's like. And what I think the question was meant to ask was something that isn't very well expressed by this question. And that is something like, well, what kind of ontology would produce a world such as the one we live in? What kind of underlying structure is it that makes the world appear to be quantum mechanical? Uh, and that's a completely different kind of question. It's not really the question that I think is, that I think usefully motivated this, this tradition in understanding mathematics and applying it to the world in the way that Einstein did. And I would say the same thing about quantum mechanics, but I'll come back to that. Now, another way of understanding the question, which I think is more useful, is the, what are the aspects of our experience that tell us that the world is a world in which uh, that is correctly described by this theory? Right? What, how, does it, how does experience sort of tell us that we, we don't live in a Newtonian world or that we don't live in a Euclidean world or if you think in sort of more simple cases, like you know, what makes us think that we live on a spherical body and not a plane? 
right? That's what it means to give an, an interpretation of this geometrical theory of the world that we live in. Uh, I'm not sure why this is. Well, it doesn't really matter if you can't read the top of that. Uh, because the important part is the, the, the last line. Uh, Einstein sort of speaking to this tradition of understanding what it means to give an interpretation of a theory, to visualize a theory, he said in the same paper, right? To bring it home to one's mind, therefore means to give representation to that abundance of experiences for which the theory provides the schematic arrangement. And this is an old view. This is a, a celebrated notion of Helmholtz. It's who, what, the sort of great philosophical step forward that Helmholtz took in making the case that the world could be non-Euclidean and it wouldn't necessarily violate our intuitions, that we can have intuitions about what it would be like to live in a non-Euclidean world. Because just for one sentence of context, uh, if, if this history isn't obvious, right, it was a, a constant battle in the May of 19th century to defend the possibility of Euclidean geometry uh, from the argument that we can't intuit a non-Euclidean space, that all of our intuitions are Euclidean and that it would be impossible to represent to ourselves some other kind of space, except in some relative way, extrinsically, the way we can, we can only represent curved spaces relative to the ambient three-dimensional flat space. So he says, well, to represent something, to, in, to intuit something, right, uh, is to depict the series of sense impressions that one would have if such a thing took place in a particular case. And so this, Einstein's idea is by that time, at least 50 years old. And it had a broader application that was seized upon by Heisenberg in talking about, in defending the idea of quantum mechanics as a description of the world. Right. We understand, uh, we have a visualizable understanding of a physical theory if we can grasp the experimental conse consequences qualitatively and see that the theory does not, to lead, not lead to any contradictions. And to me, this is a, a possibly a contentious interpretation of Heisenberg, but to me, it's a clear statement of the same general idea that we understand quantum mechanics if we can articulate the experiences that reveal the quantum mechanical character of the world. Now, Carnap took uh, a slightly different view of interpretation that I think was in a way straying away from this tradition, right? Uh, I won't read all of these quotes, they're probably familiar to anyone who knows a little bit about Carnap. Uh, but he's, he represented it as the essential movement forward of physics to abandon the idea of visualizable theoretical entities. Right? That theories are increasingly becoming a calculus supplemented by an interpretation. I mean, this is where that, I think that important distinction comes to be blurred, understanding a, uh, a mathematical structure as something that can be interpreted, but is, is inherently purely formal, and understanding a physical theory as something that's inherently formal. In one sense, what he's saying is obvious, like, well, we can't really visualize the electromagnetic field, uh, let alone the orbit of an, of an electron as understood in quantum mechanics, right? Uh, we can visualize orbits, but those aren't the ones in, of electrons. Uh, but in a sense, this idea goes back to Newton, right? When he, when he urged that to understand how the gravitational field works, it, you can't appeal to anything that you previously understand intuitively about how bodies interact with one another. You simply have to understand the mathematical law by which 
we understand the behavior of the gravitational field. It's intuitive only because it's still represented in Euclidean geometry. Right, so this is just a particular example, right? Well, uh, we don't have to understand in physics by visualizing or giving an intuitive understanding, right? We know how we can derive predictions from the symbol psi or the symbol e, right? In Maxwell's, fit, in Maxwell's equations, we could say, well, we kind of can give an intuitive understanding, but we don't need one anymore, right? We don't have to have a translation into everyday language. We just have a symbolism and we know how to derive predictions from it. Though this is another, uh, a further extension of this same idea. that when we talk about entities in any kind of theoretical language, we're really just talking about uh, aspects of a formalism that help us in arriving at predictions. And we don't have to try to answer ontological questions about whether the things we're referring to really exist. At the same time, I mean, Carnap occasionally did talk this way in a kind of realistic mode, in a kind of minimal sense of realism, namely that we come to understand the structure of the world better. How, I don't know how, uh, I think it's a, a mystery how Carnap kept these ideas together in his head without seeing that there's a kind of tension between them. But I don't think that this realistic statement that we can understand the structure of the world better is inconsistent with that minimal Carnapianism that I started out with. So let me go back to the question of space-time theory. Right? And I won't read all of these quotes either because they're quite familiar. Uh, the arguments that Einstein gave for general covariance, right? Well, we are no longer in a position to use measuring rods to measure the coordinates of space. I think the way I interpret this remark, at least, I realize a lot of what I'm talking about is uh, contentious in the philosophy of general relativity. I don't mean to take any position on the meaning and, and uh, philosophical significance of general covariance here. I'm merely focusing on this epistemological question. This is really the point uh, of my talk. Right? If coordinates were significant, it would mean that moving a measuring rod about in space was a direct reflection of a simple coordinate transformation in a Cartesian coordinates. But since we can't do that anymore, uh, we can't adapt systems of coordinates to the four dimensional universe. So we have to allow all possible coordinate transformations. Again, I won't talk too much about what general covariance really means, but the epistemological point is the significant one. Uh, all of our space-time verifications amount to a determination of space-time coincidences. If events consisted in the motion of material points, nothing would be observable at the meetings of, the, of two or more of these points. The results of our measurements are all verifications of such meetings of material points, etc. All of our physical experience can ultimately be reduced to such coincidence. I, I mean, I think that's a reasonable translation of the German word, although there are other ones. My maybe it means can be referred back, referred to, or traced back to. And this is how we arrive at the the requirement of general covariance. Now. This is a place where it seems to me that Einstein sort of steps from thinking in this, he sort of steps out of this tradition of thinking about the epistemology of geometry and in, into a, a more reductive mode, saying that everything that we, have, everything that we understand, understand as an observation of space and time 
can be boiled down to this elementary kind of experience. Uh, uh, it was Howard Stein, I guess almost 20 years ago, raised this question about the Carnapian approach to these things in general. He was using the example of the Newtonian framework, but it was a general point that he was trying to make, namely that in physics, we don't actually deduce observations. And what we, uh, because we don't have a theory of the observer, we don't have a theory that enables us to tell from quantum mechanics or from general relativity what a person will experience. And so his uh, reply to this was that to secure some kind of empirical content for a structure like, like Newtonian gravity, even a relatively simple one compared to the theories we're using now, we have to think of the observers schematically. So for example, if you say just in old fashioned Ptolemaic astronomy, right? If you're predicting that someone who stands at a certain place in time will observe something, that's really not a good prediction, right? You can't predict that because you don't know enough about observers. The remark by, by Frank Ramsey on this point was that, well, of course, we, we can't predict whether the person who stands there will have his eyes open, for example. Uh, it's a schematic representation of an observer saying that the, uh, uh, a line of sight from a given star and a line of sight from a planet will form a certain angle at a certain point on the earth. That's the kind of schematic representation of an observer. Of course, there's an even more schematic representation of an observer to do Ptolemaic planetary theory because somehow Ptolemy has to take these observations of right ascensions and declinations on the celestial sphere and construct this mathematical model in which they all lie on a plane in which he can draw combinations of circles. And it's a continuation of this same process to say in say Newtonian gravity, well, we're looking at the stars and we have this schematic representation of where planets are relative to the stars. We represent it in a plane so that we can talk about accelerations relative to the stars and a, a fixed point temporarily or provisionally fixed point representing the sun. So that's an extremely schematic representation that has nothing to do with predicting that an observer will observe something, except again in this schematic sense, right? So if we have this Keplerian picture that uh, say Jupiter sweeps out Jupiter's uh, radius sweeps out equal or equal areas in equal times, or that you know, the radius of the orbit is uh, the cube of the radius of the orbit is the square of the periodic time or proportional to it. You can derive a schematic prediction about what would be observed from a certain place on the Earth. But at no point do you can you say that you reduce the content of even that schematic pre-theoretical picture, that is you know, pre-theoretical for Newton in that there are no dynamical assumptions in it. Right? It's, it's something he could treat as a neutral observation base because it, there was nothing being assumed about forces. Right? Uh, that's a very schematic picture already that makes it possible to deduce only in this very schematic sense what would be observed on any place on the Earth. I'll skip that actually. If you think about, you know, what is the actual epistemological content of general relativity, right? Uh, the point coincidence model, just from an epistemological point of view, doesn't really help you to understand the empirical content of the theory. And it doesn't help you to understand why you would adopt such a theory in preference to Newton's. Uh, you can, there's an abstract point that can be made that anything that we observe is ultimately reducible to observations of point coincidences. You could even say, well, 
since we have a mathematical theory that's generally covariant, if we construct a picture of the world, we should accept as an equally uh, valid picture of the world any mathematical transformation of that picture that preserves the same point coincidences. But that's going in the other direction, right? That's using general covariance to prove that point coincidences are, are objective. It's not appealing to any reasonable sense in which the observations of point coincidences are objective. If you ask what the content of general relativity is in the sense that I mentioned, well, you, what you're really asking for is something like what became called in the context of quantum mechanics, the, a classical mode of description. Yeah, I don't, don't really have to read all this, but if you think of you know, what is the evidence for general relativity, what's the empirical motivation that Einstein was able to give in 1916? Or it's really, you, know, you could ask the same about the kind of empirical evidence we have now, which is of course much better. When we have coordinate systems, right, which we establish on the basis of the same kind of observation that Newton used. Right? We have small regions in which we can uh, determine a suitably inertial frame, a sufficiently inertial frame. And an essential aspect of general covariance, according to Einstein, was this separately from the mathematical argument, the empirical argument that thanks to the equivalence principle, uh, the classical Newtonian idea of an inertial frame breaks down because an, a Newtonian, the Newtonian theory of inertial frames requires strictly that any other inertial frame is also inertial with respect to any given inertial frame, that any two inertial frames move inertially with respect to each other. And that's what breaks down, that justifies general covariance from a, an evidentiary point of view. So what does Newton do? What does Einstein do to justify this? Well, he, he talks about inertial systems in which one observes another system to be relatively accelerating. But since the other system internally can be equally regarded as an inertial system, we have, a, we have this peculiar case in which two completely legitimate inertial systems are not behaving like inertial systems in a larger picture. There's no inertial frame that encompasses them both. And that has nothing to do with this reductive character of observation that we find in the, the kind of general covariance uh, point coincidence view that Einstein used as an epistemological basis. Because to argue for the theory, the important thing is uh, not the epistemological basis in this fundamentally reductive sense, but the evidentiary basis in the sense of the systematic observations that acquaint us with this property of the world in the terms in which he originally used when he was talking about, uh, when he was talking in general about the empirical content of geometry in the quote that I mentioned earlier from 1921. Now, I know uh, Eddington said a lot of crazy things about physics in his books on philosophy of physics, but in 1918, when he was introducing Einstein's theory to the British uh, theoretical physics community, he said something which has always struck me as extremely reasonable about, he was defending the idea that calling, saying that we live in a world of a curved space-time is not in any, is not some kind of problematic metaphysics or uh, a weird unobservable entity. And there's nothing metaphysical in the statement that under certain circumstances, the measured circumference of a circle is less than pi times the measured diameter. It's a matter for experiment. 
we've simply been studying the way in which physical measures of length and time fit together, just as Maxwell's equations describe how electrical and magnetic forces fit together. The trouble is that we've inherited a preconceived idea of the way in which measures, if true, ought to fit. And it seems to me that that's a, a fairly concise and uh, reasonable statement of what Einstein is talking about when he says we're required to give up the idea of a uniform space-time by the equivalence principle. We expect inertial frames to fit together, and they don't. And, and this is how we interpret the claim that we live in a world that is characterized by non-Euclidean geometry. And again, these are all, I'm just referring to these, a, a whole bunch of famous quotes from mine. So I think I have a couple of moments left, if that's okay. Sure. Um, Einstein's argument against the completeness of quantum mechanics has, uh, it, it doesn't have the same form as the argument about, it can be responded to in the same form as the argument about inertial frames and about non-Euclidean space times. Uh, I won't repeat what the basic EPR argument is uh, or Bohr's response to it. I'll just try to summarize what my philosophical point about it is since I'm running out of time. Uh, and the, the notion of the classical mode of description. Bohr talks about the impossibility of carrying through a causal representation of, co of quantum phenomena. What is he really talking about and why does he insist that we have to, why does he insist that we have to stick to the classical mode of description for the experimental setting? Well, he says, well, for the requirement of communicability of circumstances and the results of experiments, right? We have to speak of well-defined exper experiences only within the framework of ordinary concepts. Now, that I think by itself doesn't really tell you the full force of his answer to Einstein's concern. If you look at what Einstein was sort of deeply concerned about in quantum mechanics or claimed to be, uh, this notion that if we don't, if we aren't able to characterize the system that we're studying completely and locally, uh, and separately from other systems that are spatially separate from it, uh, then we can't really do theoretical physics, right? An essential aspect of this arrangement is that, is that they lay claim at a certain time to an existence independent of one another, provided that they're situated in different parts of space. Unless one makes this kind of assumption about the independence of the existence of spatially separated objects, physical thinking in the familiar sense would not be possible. It's also hard to see any way of formulating and testing the laws of physics if one makes a, if one, unless one makes a clear distinction of this kind. So he's trying to say that physics would be impossible if we really accepted that quantum mechanical systems are not truly separable, for example, if they're entangled. And Bohr even acknowledges in another familiar long quote, well, the, the coexistence of uh, the, the, the coexistence of new physical laws might seem of the kind that we're discovering, we've discovered in quantum mechanics, might seem irreconcilable with the basic principles of science. But that's the situation we're trying to characterize. And what does he mean by that? Well, and I think if one sticks to the notion that it's the evidentiary basis rather than the epistemological basis that teaches us things like that space-time is curved or that inertial frames are purely local and can be relatively accelerating, right? I think this is a really deep sense in which the founders of quantum mechanics were correct in thinking that they were 
applying the same method as Einstein. Uh, and that is that, well, let me, you could say it's, it's perfectly reasonable for Einstein to demand that we can completely characterize a the state of a local system. And that if we couldn't, we couldn't really begin to do physics. And, but that's sort of parallel in a way to the notion that we can't, we can't start analyzing forces of gravity, for example, without adopting a local inertial frame or trying to find a, find a locally rigid frame that we can, whose inertial character we can try to figure out. And it's perfectly reasonable, it's a reasonable expectation that there should be an integrable picture of all inertial frames in one inertial frame. I mean, even Kant pointed out, you know, centuries earlier that this is the kind of ideal of reason, an idea of reason in his technical sense and not something that was likely to happen in a finite time. But it's only a reasonable expectation and it's perfectly, we're, we're perfectly capable as, as Einstein's argument for extending the relativity principle and Bohr's argument for accepting the bizarre results of quantum mechanics. Uh, it's an empirical question whether the local pictures can be integrated into a mathematically reasonable whole. And so Einstein has the right to say that I should, my local causal picture should be extendable into a global causal picture. But that's no different from saying, I, I have the right to expect that every inertial frame will be in uniform motion relative to every other inertial frame and that there is a global inertial frame that will encompass all the bodies that I can observe. It's a reasonable expectation, but it's perfectly easy to understand empirically how such an, expe an expectation can break down. This is what I call the ineffective reasonableness of mathematics, that the history of mathematics, the history of mathematical physics is like this, that the most reasonable expectation of how our, the, our understanding at a given time can be extended into a, logical, a larger theoretical framework is just defeated sometimes. The Newtonian expectation of uh, a global inertial frame fails. The Einsteinian expectation of a larger causal picture into which individual analyses of quantum systems fit fails. And that's an empirical question. And I think this makes it reasonable to understand. I think I'm going to end here. Uh, it, it makes it, I think that it makes it reasonable to understand how we can come to uh, understand the breakdown of formal frameworks in Carnap's sense without having to understand, uh, uh, without having to treat it as a purely pragmatic problem of making an arbitrary choice to pick one frame over another. And at the same time, it, it shows us how we can understand that uh, the empirical content of theoretical frameworks without appealing to a kind of reductive basis, as in Einstein's point coincidence argument or, or Carnap's uh, pure observation language. So I think I'll end there. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, so we have Ken, the first in line, so please Ken. Um, thank you very, very much for the talk, Robert. And uh, we did meet some while ago, and I am indeed still working on these issues, if not always as conservatively as I wish. Um, I'd like to suggest a couple of things about Carnap. And I think that um, you are highlighting important features of his views. And you're right that there's a puzzle about how he could have held his axiomatic aspirations 
uh, in mind together with some of what he says about um, reduction or at least partial reduction to an evidentiary base. But also the part I wanna put back into this that you'll expect is Carnap's pragmatics, right? Carnap in 32-33 replied to Sizzle and Duncan that all of his logical syntax of language and the same holds for the formalized semantics we get later, it's uninterpretable formalism unless and until actual protocol statements made by actual scientists are taken into account. And that remains equally important to the earlier part of the probability book, right? Chapter one, where Carnap finally lays out a method he's been using since the Aufbau of conceptual explication, where of course, conceptual explications can only be assessed and must be assessed in actual context of their humanly possible use. And so there is this semantic and justificatory externalism in Carnap's methods that I think he never really fully appreciated or capitalized upon. And I think part of what you've been pointing out about this trajectory within the sciences and where Carnap diverges from the physical interpretation of these highly mathematical theories is exactly at this point. So I just wanna add one more log into your structure about where Carnap could have, and I think should have done better than he did about just the topics you're focusing on. I'll stop there, thank you. Oh, thanks for that. I'll just, um, I don't know if you want a reaction from me, but my, uh, I, that remark that I quoted from him about getting a deeper insight into the structure, there are several places where uh, he says things that often uh, offend naturalist sensibilities. I don't know if you remember, you know, Penelope Maddy's book, for example, uh, talking about the internal external distinction and saying, you know, when <clears throat> quoting Carnap is saying things that are hard to understand from that perspective. Like, well, if I think there are atoms, it's because I choose to adopt a framework it, that includes atoms as terms. And she's rightly bothered by that. We all are probably, or some of us are. And uh, because we'd, we'd all like to think that there was a sort of discovery of atoms or a kind of justification of that, that in say the early 20th century that didn't exist before. And, and there was something more going on than choosing the formalism that, that quantifies over them. And, and then, but then there are times when Carnap talks about, you know, X-ray crystallography as, you know, things are observable to us that weren't before and we're extending our reach into these realms. And then, you know, and that's a sense in which he's talking more in the language that I am thinking in of having to do with the evidentiary base rather than some kind of, uh, reductive basis, right? That, that you know, we, have, we have methods within the broad framework of physical theory for coming up with evidence about ontology. You know, Newton doesn't say, let's adopt a framework with a gravitational field. He says, well, let's adopt this framework that allows us to probe for fields, or I mean, probe for forces in his terms, right? We're not assuming there are any forces, but this framework lets us probe for them and, and allows us to treat these sort of these schematically represented observations as evidence. So I think there's a lot that Carnap said that's in the right direction, what I think of as the right direction. A brief footnote, of course, is you won't be surprised. I think that Bill Harper is entirely right about the methodological significance and the substantive significance of Newton's rule four, 
right? Rule four rules out merely arbitrary choices of linguistic frameworks, All right? If you I want a new one, but that's, that's I'm sorry. sorry. I never quite thought of it that way, but I, I mean, I think it, it seems quite right now that you now that you say it. I've never really thought of it in relation to Karna. It's just, I mean, it's it seems to me fairly clear that he, in many, in the first edition of the Principia, he used the word hypothesis in a sense that he no longer used it in the subsequent editions because a certain uh, just a historical circumstance, right? The certain usage became publicly well defined, right? right. Uh, so the idea that you know you can't argue, you can't refute an inductive argument with anything but counter evidence. You can't refute it by a hypothesis, or you can't even counter it with a hypothesis. Only only contrary evidence is sufficient. Contrary, but because it's either more precise or it identifies specifiable limits to the established theory, right? Those are the two prongs in rule four. And hypotheses don't meet that, right? A well-grounded theory does. Yeah, I, I had a slide that I skipped over because I was taking too long about this Newtonian sense of what it means to attribute mathematical laws to the world. But I, I won't go into that unless anyone wants me to. Thanks for your reply. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Uh, next in line, we have uh, Richard. Please go ahead, Richard. Thank you. I have one extremely small point and, and one rather large point, and the two are not related. Uh, the small point, could you put up your slide where you have Einstein's dialectic, a quote on the principle of local action? Oh, um, sure. Uh, Well, I think you just skipped over it. Oh, here we go. Yeah, okay. Um, if we read his formulation the way you have written it here, it says external influence from A has no direct influence on B. Now, I have always thought that the principle said external influence on A has no direct influence on B. And just to make sure I wasn't uh, mistaken, I, I looked at what Bill Demopoulos says this principle states in, in his book, uh, and he agrees with, with my translation. Uh, this is of some importance because if we take the word to be on instead of from, this is extremely close to a kind of interventionist uh, notion of causation, which is currently very popular. But if the word is from, then there's no such association. Um, and certainly the original German was von, which is not normally translated, I think, as on. It's more normally translated as from. So there's a bit of a puzzle here. Um, I just wanted to direct your attention to, to, to indicate that, uh, that, that there's further investigation necessary to actually understand what Einstein's principle was. Uh, and I'm, I think it always in the past to, uh, taken it to be a case where he's considering an external influence on A, not an external influence from A. And I'm not even sure what an external influence from A would be. What would be the significance of the word external if it was translated from as from in this case? Um, I don't want to go further on this point. Um, if you want to respond to it, fine. But I do have a big question. Well, um, I, I, it's something that I've always thought was puzzling, but uh, there, I guess that I, I can think of two ways of, of reading, right? One is the experiment that I do on A has no influence on B, mm -hmm. which okay. I take it is what you're, suggesting 
Yes. Um, but it's not, it, in that sense, it possibly doesn't make sense, right? I mean, I can do an experiment on two spatially separated objects at the same time, right? By, by turning on a light that will, you know, reach both of them at the same time, though they're incapable of influencing each other. So right. you'd have to, you have to really restrict the meaning of that to say that, a, that an experiment that I do on A that is that is also causally isolated from B. Yes. No influence on B, right? Mm -hmm. So this well, is. I suppose uh, if what I do is only on A, I I locally interact only on A. Right. So you'd have to add that restriction to this to make it to make to make it something like ruling out you know intervening on on part of a of an entangled system can't influence the other part you'd have right. to add, I, it seems like a restriction that's not clearly in there right uh, that's a good point but on the other hand the word external is in there and if we translate it as from what will be an internal influence from a that's not clear what that means right yeah uh i it 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 is, I think it is puzzling, but I think there's no interpretation on that that makes sense to me that doesn't include the idea of no uh, non-local propagation of influence. I agree with you on that, certainly. Do I get to ask my big question or am I already yeah. on my time? I'm... Please go ahead, Richard. Okay. Um, this concerns your interesting novel to me, uh, notion of interpretation. Um, of a, a physical theory. Um, I've also been um, suspicious of the, the Van Frassen formulation that to interpret a physical theory to see what the world would be like if that theory were true of it. Um, but I've, I've gone in a rather different direction, which I think um, Kona should have been sympathetic to, whether or not he was. Um, given a physical theory, what you are concerned and to relate to the evidentiary basis. And that's an interesting thing to do. Um, that's as it were looking at the, the input from um, what we do to the theory. Um, we observe things and that provides the evidentiary basis for the theory. But the theory also has an output. Um, we are not merely observers, we are also agents in the world. So part of what's involved, I think, in interpreting a physical theory is um, saying how that theory is applied uh, to do various things. And if one can give a sufficiently rich story of what it is to apply the theory in various different circumstances, that is a huge contribution towards interpreting the theory, even though perhaps it's not all that's involved in interpreting a theory. I add this application because I think uh, you know, the, the pragmatist side of Conrad would like that, but whatever he said about it. Um, what do you think about that? Oh, I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up because uh, I think one of the sort of, an aspect of the tradition that Conrad was coming out of was a sort of conventionalist notion, right? That Poincaré's idea that uh, F equals MA, for example, is a definition and not a claim about the world. And I think it's much, it's much better interpreted. I mean, there's, there's sort of two aspects of my answer to this. Part of it has to do with my thinking of that it's fundamentally wrong to think of Newton's theory, for example, or any theory as an uninterpreted formalism, because it's not just a calculus. It is fundamentally about things moving in space and time. But in, in a kind of Carnapian sense, it really has to be treated as a proposal. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think the Poincaré view was groping toward and misrepresenting. That when, when, when Carnap talks about principles that he uses that he admits are not verifiable, they're not supposed to be verifiable, they are proposals, right? Newton's laws are in a sense proposals or sort of commands to do something, right? 
And I think Ramsey also represented it in this way. And when I, a, a law is telling me something, when I, when I see a, a, a phi, I, I must treat it as a psi. Yes. Simple. Right. And so I don't know if I'm thinking along the same lines you are, but it seems to me that that's how a theory in theoretical physics works to sort of demand that you find the source of any acceleration. Mm -hmm. And that's an essential part of its interpretation, that it's telling you to do that. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I think that's exactly right. So I'm glad to see that we're thinking along some of the lines. Thank you. No, thanks very much. I, um, yeah, I, I should definitely think more about your work on this. Okay. Probably. Uh, next, two, we have uh, Vasilis. Yes. <clears throat> Am I heard? Yes. Yeah. Hi, Robert. That was very good. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Very intriguing. I have a, a question and a remark. Now, if I understood you well, uh, in the beginning of your talk, you made a distinction between two views of interpretation. One is the well-known one, the Van Frassen one, and the other uh, is uh, that uh, having an assembly of experiences, we seek the appropriate mathematical formulation that accommodates them, accounts for it somehow. Now, the question is, are these two independent of one another? Because you may have um, theoretical, mathematical formulations of uh, one and the same assembly of uh, experiences that are empirically equivalent or are equivalent in any other sense. And it has been argued that uh, depending on the notion of equivalence of theories that you have, there are definite constraints for the ontology of the theory according to the first, in, the first notion of interpretation, what the world would be like if the theory were true. There's a close connection between the two. And it, the, final, <clears throat> the final slides, when you, uh, you spoke about this minimal realism, you spoke about the unobservable and the role of the unobservable, which uh, points to considerations of ontological questions. That's, that's my question. And uh, <clears throat> I have a remark. Um, if you go to, the, to one of the first slides uh, on Carnap, where you explained the position of Carnap, a physical theory provides a conceptual framework that defines a set of internal questions about the nature and existence of its objects. That's it. Right. Now, when you make the comparison between uh, general relativity and um, quantum mechanics, there's a big difference. I agree with what you said about the common points of the two theories, but there's a big difference because in all quantum theories, there's no such a conceptual framework because in quantum theories, there's no way to define what a quantum object is. The only thing you have in quantum theories is a, a definition of a mathematical framework and experimental techniques that cooperate very closely and allow you to talk about the states of quantum objects, but you don't have a clear idea of what a quantum object is in the context of uh, quantum theory, there's no definition of what an electron is. You only talk about the states of an electron. So that's, 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 a, that's a big difference. <clears throat> it does not concern your talk directly, but it does make a difference when we talk about uh, extension of theories, uh, the questions you touched upon uh, towards the end of your talk. Well, I, I think that's a really important point. I would, wouldn't want anything I said to try to minimize the peculiar difficulties of interpreting quantum mechanics. What I, what I was endorsing was the idea that uh, I think what, what Bohr and Heisenberg were trying to do was to interpret the claim that you know, we live in a non-classical world. I don't think anyone is happy with 
that I, and no one I know personally is happy with their formulations of how quantum mechanics should be interpreted. But that, that you can learn from evidential reasoning that the, the classical picture that Einstein wanted is, is ruled, out, ruled out by experience in the same way that the global inertial frame was ruled out. That there are locally well-defined uh, reasoning from locally well-defined reasoning from evidence to arrive at a locally well-defined picture. And there's an impossibility of integrating it into a larger picture of a certain kind that you would have expected. And that's, I mean, as in that quote from, from Eddington, right, that we have, it seems like you, you're entering into a weird new kind of science, but actually it's only because you expected a certain kind of integration to work out between locally well-defined pictures that on a larger scale fails. I mean, you know, this, I think this has been happening since Newton, right? That, you know, there are interactions in the world that simply can't be explicated on the model of a collection of particle impacts because of peculiar features of these interactions that Newton points out. Right? But, uh, but it's not, not quite the same thing. I mean, it is a, Fund, to me, a, a, one way of thinking about the difference between relativity and quantum mechanics is that, you know, as, as, as weird as it might be that you have local inter inertial frames that are relatively accelerating, and as weird as it might seem that there's no nice inertial picture that you can place them all into, you can still think of a local inertial frame as part of a whole, right? That your local inertial frame is an approximation to an inertial frame that's part of a larger continuum, right? And, and I think that notion of, that a, of a part and whole relationship uh, fails in the case of quantum mechanics. I mean, it's one of many ways of thinking about what's weirder about quantum mechanics ontologically. Um, but I think what Heisenberg and, and Bohr were arguing against Schrodinger and Einstein wasn't so much, I mean, at least it's not interesting so much to me because of an alternative ontology that they had, but just to say that we, we can tell from evidential reasoning and inductive generalizations that uh, there is no classical picture of these phenomena. And that that's and that's the kind of world we live in. This is how we we know we don't live in a in a classical world. And I think there is, even as weird as it is compared to anything classical, it's not there. There's a certain analogy between that and finding out you know we don't live on a plane. You know we don't live in a uniform space time. Uh, okay, um, we can move forward. There is a question from uh, Aaron. So Aaron, please go ahead. Am I audible? Yes. yes. Um, uh, I don't know, uh, I arrived late because I was at another meeting which in a sense partly overlaps with this. So uh, something might have been said about this before I came, but I, uh, I apologize if that's true. W one of the things that uh, has struck me about Newtonian physics that doesn't seem to get mentioned is that how much of everyday life contradicts it. For example, uh, as far as I can tell, there's nothing in New Newton's theory that explains how two particles can bond together. Uh, they can bounce off each other and they can influence one another through gravitational forces. But uh, roughly speaking, there's nothing else. On the other hand, if that's true, then you could not have ropes and levers and pivots. Um, 
which played a huge role in in both in, in Newton thinking and, and all the years of application of Newtonian theory um, for these rigid objects to exist or extended objects to exist, which have an enduring shape, size, uh, connection, you need quantum mechanisms to uh, explain the bonding of, of atoms uh, in a way that Newton couldn't have said anything about. So I just wonder if this is just an oddity that Newton never noticed about the contradictions between what his theory actually talks about and what his subject matter is about, or whether he did notice it and that's why he got into uh, some of the weird stuff about chemistry and um, uh, you know trying to go beyond what at the time or even looking back people thought of as sensible science but i just don't know Do, does anyone know whether newton noticed the problem that i'm talking about well i i don't think anyone noticed it until the late 19th century well, right. i mean i think it's just not clear when you embark on the Newtonian program that it's not going to work. That, right. So the, I think the way Newton thought of it was, and this is part of his alchemical researches, if it had a, a reasonable part, I think this was it, that he thought that by the analogy to gravity, everything that was a sort of structure, right? Everything that happened that, that isn't simply basic particles bouncing off one another and behaving inertially. Of course, the idea that how they bounce off one another is something else to be explained, right? Yeah, elasticity. Yeah. Right, he thought, he thought there would be there, I've found one of the forces that holds things together and there must be a bunch of others and, 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 and there must be things that hold atoms together. Mm. And I don't know that anyone until the late 19th century thought that you know the the stability of matter was impossible on, on any classical model right but certainly newton didn't i think he thought that eventually other other forces analogous to gravity would be unearthed and would explain all of these things and he says that as in several places explicitly right, right? I found one force and there must be others that, that are responsible for all, all of the other chemical and physical phenomena. And that could explain his interest in alchemy, which I've often heard referred to as if it was a, an example of his brain going soft or something, <laughs> <laughs> becoming superstitious. It might not be that at all, but trying to find some source of evidence to explain the things he knew he couldn't explain. But I just don't know. I'm not a, I'm not really a Newton scholar. I think it may have been both. Yeah, perhaps. I think there's interest in, you know, inter, intermolecular, what we would call intermolecular forces, whole, forces responsible for cohesion was something, was a motivation for him, if, even if he also had wackier motivations. I wonder what he would have thought about all the virtual machines that run on computing systems. For instance, Zoom meetings, <laughs> with all these connections between people uh, which come and go while there's a rigid collection of wires and, and uh, batteries and um, electrical apparatus and so on uh, that doesn't move around in anything like the same way. Um, <laughs> Well, you know, it might all have been, it, it's not inconceivable that classical electrodynamics could have been enough to explain how all of this works. Right? Yeah. Hertz, Maxwell Hertz, right? Explaining all of this transmission over wires and, and wirelessly. It just didn't work out that way. I mean, it's not logically impossible, right? Yes, although something else is needed to explain the existence of virtual machines, uh, by which I mean real things like Zoom meetings, which endure across changing physical substrate, which have become uh, an invisible fact of life in the last 20, 30 years, uh, invisible to most people, uh, but very visible to a, a large cohort 
of electronic and computational and software engineers who contribute different aspects to this this reality. Indeed. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, we have again Ken. Please go ahead, Ken. I just wanted to come back briefly to this issue about um, gross chunks of matter that have enough mass that Newton's theory can be interested in them. Uh, the problem certainly had been identified by the later 18th century. It exercised Kant who botched it badly, but Newton's own experiments in alchemy and the likes had quite uh, an important role in stimulating further work in chemistry. And the other thing in matter theory is crystallography, right? Why does some matter form in these beautiful crystalline forms? That was a huge issue in the 18th century. They didn't know what to do with it, but issues about gross matter and its cohesion were on the agenda, but nobody had the science to deal with them yet. Um, if you want, I can give a reference to a wonderful article by Vashkis on um, Newton's influence on the develop positive influence on development of chemistry. I'll try to put that into the chat. No, I appreciate that. Yeah, just <clears throat> um, the, the main point that I would make is that it, there wasn't any reason to anticipate that the basic classical framework would have to break down in explaining these things. And also that's a, you know, it's a fundamentally interesting fact about the Newtonian framework that entirely inside of it, so to speak, and this is a kind of, you know, un uncarnapian fact about the history of physics, right? Within the framework of Newtonian physics, you discover things that don't fit in it, right? Like, like the nature of the electrodynamic field, right? The electromagnetic field and, and electrodynamics of moving bodies that you know completely discoverable and sort of provisionally uh, represented in a in a theory that is consistent with Newtonian space and time, and yet when fully understood, more or less requires its breakdown. Thanks, um, and do do send the. Reference. Okay, uh, Pedro wants to ask a question. Please, Pedro, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Antonio. And thanks, uh, Robert, for your talk. Uh, mm, I would like to, well, just uh, know your thoughts on, because your talk has been uh, dealing with the epistemological foundations of space time. So, it happens that basically I much uh, uh, sympathize with uh, well this uh, shape dynamics uh, put forward by Julian Barrow, which relies on basic space, so instead of space time, and this goes back to basically uh, an old idea of vials that for some reasons didn't quote work out as uh, placing instead of lens as angles as. Uh, basically are more primitive uh, resource for empirical. So uh, what are your thoughts on, on the, because from the historical point of view, I mean, empirical point of view, if you like, I mean, it's not clear to me whether it's uh, distances that come prior to, to angle. Actually, I mean, I mean, I sympathize with, with the latter being more fundamental in terms of putting your eyes say, uh, along the, a rod and making uh, comparisons with uh, the length of uh, some uh, table for, for say. So, well, I mean, what uh, do you have any thoughts on basically this uh, distinction between space time versus uh, space on the epistemological grounds? Well, I've always thought that the, the epistemology of space is, uh, fundamentally based on the idea of motion, right, of rigid motion. 
I think that you know Helmholtz and Poincaré were were correct that the, the primitive idea of it comes from that because it's an idea that you don't need light to share and that you know people who can't see are per perfectly capable of having a notion of space because they can move and even a person who can see has a notion of a three-dimensional visual field be and its geometrical structure from the ability to move. And it's just, it's a peculiar feature of, you know, the slowness of our lives generally, <laughs> the slowness of our motions and our very small size, both with respect to light propagation, that we, we can think of space group theoretically, right? We think that motions can just be reversed and that we can understand spatial changes in this way as you know, group operations. And this has to do with the fact that we can ignore time in this sense, right? We think you know, we can put things back the way they were in space, whereas time goes forward and we can't go back to, to an earlier time, but, but space is separable in that way, right? We, you know, we can go to the same place at a later time, but we can't go back to an, an earlier time. And that this is, you know, relativity tells us that this is an approximately reasonable view to have because you're so small and slow moving, but it's not really true, right? But it's because we're so small and so, and so slow moving, we, we can think of space and time as separable in this way. And, and, and that's just an approximation, right? So it, epistemolo epistemologically, I think there's a sort of primitive character to this, but it's not really ontologically primitive, right? It's just that we're slow moving animals who are very small and that light propagation is, might as well be infinitely fast until you start doing really careful experiments, right? So that we think we can sort of separate spatial aspects of our experience and call them fundamental, but they're not really fundamental. They're just elementary in our experience. And that's what I think a lot of the history of the, the notion of relativity of motion is based on, that there's a notion that has no justification fundamentally, except in the elementary character of our experience, that spatial relations are sort of given and objective and everything else is a kind of construction on top of those, right? And uh, that is just an illusion created by the fact that we're so small and slow moving, right? We live in a relativistic world that looks like a world in which spatial relations are, are epistem epistemically basic, right? But they're not really. So uh, there's this idea going through the history of uh, arguments for the relativity of motion that uh, that spatial relations are a kind of objective foundation when they're not. I mean, not that that makes the the relativity of motion in the sense of Newtonian relativity, general relativity, and special relativity invalid in any way. It just means that this this notion of an epistemic basis in spatial relations is a kind of illusion that small, slow moving creatures have. Uh, and this is why, you know, in a sense, it was, it was so radical for Einstein to question simultaneity, right? No one, no one who ever talked about the relativity of time before Einstein ever thought of the relativity of simultaneity. You know, none of those, no one who ever argued for the relativity of time before Einstein doubted that there was an objective fact about which events were simultaneous and therefore about spatial relations. So I think there's a sense in which you can think of them as primitive psychologically and epistemically, 
but not fundamental. That's the short answer. Sorry, I should have given that first. Um, well, I, I don't want to keep much longer, but uh, um, if I got it right, you seem, uh, be, because I mean, for for a fact, I mean, uh, you, you can include or the content of relativistic theories with just uh, basically uh, three geometries. It's not the case that, because you been talking about slow motion and so it's not like we are talking a, an approximate sense that basically the content of relativity cannot be basically uh, met. So this is basically what uh, this shape dynamics has been doing for, for two decades. So it's just that basically it uh, shifts the emphasis from space time to space. But of course, at, at, uh, basically you have to include some other the symmetry structure of the two theories differ, but but okay, that's uh, uh, a bit uh, out of the topic now. So my, my question is, uh, well, it was a uh, kind of comment on on basically uh, because uh, instead of uh, special distances, I agree that uh, epistemological speaking are not fundamental fundamental, but uh, angles. I mean, instead of uh, ratios of uh, relative distances are. And in this theory, basically, it's not the case that basically you just get rid of time as uh, because it's um, approximately accurate to do so. No, it's because you can basically reproduce the content of, of GR in this uh, in this uh, alternative setting. But uh, okay, I mean, and uh, don't want to keep this uh, long than necessary. So okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Other questions? Well, I have a kind of speculative one, uh, which is um, um, how uh, your discussion, your analysis uh, should be uh, updated uh, in light of uh, quantum gravity and uh, the, the possibility that uh, uh, space time uh, uh, is, uh, is not uh, uh, say a fundamental part uh, of our physical theory, well, to, to come, but um, so yeah, how do you handle the possibility of uh, the existence of a non spatial temporal kind of regime? Well, I don't think there's this, I don't, I don't have a, a view of theories that demands that space-time is fundamental. Uh, I was, I'm just, uh, I would think that the same question that I ask about, you know, quantum mechanics or classical quantum mechanics or quantum field theory or general relativity would have to be asked about such a theory, right? Whenever it arrives that, you know, we just to, to interpret that theory would be to explicate what is it in our experiments or our experience or that reveals to us that the world has such a an underlying structure right i mean you know so one argument against string theory which i i, I don't share this i don't think i know enough about string theory to rule it or any other competitor out but you know if you give the argument about string theory that well it's a mathematical formalism uh, that has uh, a representation of every possible kind of physical field, in, including gravity, but it it has uh, you know it has no empirical content that's accessible to us. I don't know if that's true, but that's a, you know a common complaint about it, right? Um, and there's a theory in which space time, as we know, it is not fundamental. Uh, you know, is, is the world really like that? I would say, well, if the, you know, I, there's nothing in what I've said about giving empirical content to theories that would make it in, impossible for me to think about string theory as having some definite empirical content. And if it didn't have any definite empirical content, then I would say, uh, well, then it's sort of like, 
Riemannian geometry, right? It's, we can think of Riemannian geometry in which every theory of how space could possibly be or space-time can be represented as part of a general framework. But Riemannian geometry isn't physics, it's a mathematical framework in which lots of, you know, every kind of space we can think of, uh, well, I guess that's not true, but every, every Riemannian space we can think of can be represented. Um, and it's, it's not meant to be a physical theory, but string theory is, so presumably that means that, you know, even, even if we don't have the kind of power to create experiments that, that make it clear that we live in such a world, we can at least think about what it would mean to live in such a world. Okay. And uh, you know, that, that's fine with me. That's fine with the way I'm thinking about theories. Okay, thank you very much. Oh.